There are no two ways to God. No two ways to heaven. There is one way to one holy God, and that is through the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. The only way to the only God. And we all come to God through the same way, the cross. And it's at the cross that we're all made equal. Great sinners in need of a great savior. Doesn't matter how big your bank balance is. Doesn't matter how much charity work you have done. Great sinners in need of a great savior. Sinners saved by grace. So we're currently in a series of messages on our vision and values as a church, and we are continuing that series this morning with our next value. We believe in the people of God. We believe in the people of God, but we can't believe in something if we don't understand what it means. And so that's our purpose this morning, is to learn, see, and know what and who are the people of God. What and who are the people of God? God. And as we, as we look at this, as we, as we learn this, the first thing to note for us this morning is that the people of God are people. And you might think, okay, why are you telling me that? Well, because we live in a day and an age when we need to define with clarity and authority and honesty what a person is, what a human is. And we see that really clearly for us as the Bible defines it for us in Genesis 1 verse 27. We heard it read, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the people of God are people. What is people? What is a person? A person is someone who's created by God in his image, in his image, which means that every person has dignity and value because they are created in the image of God. They're also created male and female. Two genders assigned by their creator at their creation. And being created by God means that every person, male and female, is created for God's purposes. Every person in the image of God with dignity and value, male and female, assigned to them by their creator, and they all have a purpose given to them by their creator. That is a person. That is what we believe at Ridgeway. That is what the Bible says. But of course, every person is a person. So, What sets the people of God apart from other people? What sets the people of God apart from other people? Well, to answer that question, we will look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. So if you could turn there or scroll there, I want you to keep it open. This morning, we will have it up on the screen as we move along. But the word will be preached this morning. So keep it open in front of you if you can. And in Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. And he tells us two primary identity markers that sets the people of God apart from just mere people. First, he tells us that the people of God were once once dead and are now alive. The people of God are once dead and now alive. And secondly, the people of God were once separated and now united. Once dead, now alive. Once separated, now united. The first of those will be a little bit longer this morning, and the second of those markers will be a little bit shorter this morning. So by the time we come to the end of explaining the first, don't then think, oh my word, how long will the second be also? The first is longer, the second is shorter. The people of God, once dead, now alive, once separated, now united. And in Ephesians 2, Paul, just like I have done this morning, starts fast and hard, straight in. And he doesn't hold back. 
because what we're about to hear is the truth and nothing but the truth. And he begins with telling us that the people of God were once, were once dead. Once dead. Or listen to verses one and two. And Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, which means lived, following the course of this world. You were once dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, lived following the course of this world. And since the start, <clears throat> and oh, sorry, this kind of death that Paul is speaking about here is not physical death, because obviously all of us, before we were Christians, were once alive. He's talking about being, being spiritually dead. Being spiritually dead. We were all, every Christian was once spiritually dead. Had no inner spiritual life. Example. Uh, before you were a Christian, you had eyes that could see all the stars in the sky, but you could not, you did not have the spiritual eyes to comprehend how beautiful the stars were and that they pointed to the fact that there was a creator behind them. You were alive and yet spiritually you were dead. Example, we had ears to hear the Bible message in church, maybe as as, as children, but we didn't have the spiritual hearing to comprehend that this Bible message is true and I must respond to it with my whole life. We were physically alive, but spiritually we were dead. Example, we had the heart to love ourselves and even in some sense to love others, but we didn't have the spiritual heart to believe in and love Jesus. We were dead dead and every unbeliever right now is dead and we were dead and they are dead because of sin because of sin and since the start of time being dead has always been the consequence of sin It's in Genesis chapter 2, isn't it? That our God says the result of sin is death. Yes, physical death even. Because remember, before sin, Adam and Eve would live forever. It was only once they sinned that then physical death entered into the world. But greater than physical death, spiritual death. Being separated from the God of life forever. Dead in your sin because of your sin. But what is sin? What is sin? If the consequences of sin are so terrible, then help me. What is sin? Well, 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 tells us what sin is. And John, the apostle of Jesus, makes it very clear. He says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning, also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. What does lawlessness mean? It means to break God's law. Sin is to break God's law. And that word which Paul used at the start of Ephesians 2, that we were dead in our sin and trespasses, the word trespass also means this. It's another word for sin, another word for breaking the law of God. Before you were a Christian, my friends, you could do nothing but break God's law. Or do you realize that? Before you were a Christian, you could do nothing but break God's law. Do you remember what it was like? Before you were a Christian, you would make choices based on what you wanted, not on what God wanted. You would live your way, not his way. The commandments of God, all 10 of them, represent God's law. They are God's law. Many of you have learned them. Many of you have heard of them. And it is those commandments expressed in those 10 phrases and then expanded upon by Jesus Christ himself. It is those 
commandments. It is that law which shows us what is right and wrong. And it is written on the hearts of every person in the world, on the conscience of every human in the world. Oh, it may be shadowed, it may be twisted and broken, but it's there. And when you were dead in your sin, you were constantly breaking his law. You, you were a thief. You, you stole things. Not just physically, but even emotionally, you stole from others. You lied. And if you say that you hadn't lied, then you're a liar. We've all lied. You were jealous of others. Even for that split second as you saw someone on TV and it entered your heart. You wanted what they wanted, not content with what you have. You committed lust. Some of you physically acted on this lust. Some of you just acted on it in your heart and in your mind. You didn't honor the Sabbath day. You went out on a Saturday night and got drunk and on a Sunday you slept in, ate food and watched TV. You didn't honor the Lord's holy day. You didn't honor your mother and your father. You worshiped more gods than just one, the God. You wore, or you worshiped yourself, sport, sex, money, and power. And you did not, this is the one, you did not love God with all of your heart all of your mind, all of your strength, and all of your soul for every minute of every day. Thus, you broke God's law. You were a sinner, and you were dead in that sin. And because you were dead, you couldn't live any other way. I was at a funeral earlier this year, and the, peop and the person who was leading it uh, did a great job of telling us when to walk in, when to sit down, when to stand back up, and we all followed exactly what he said, every command of his except from one person in the room. Do you know who that was? The person who was dead. The person whose funeral it was. Oh, this guy said sit, he stayed there. He said stand, he stayed there. He didn't obey one command that was said. Why? He didn't have the hearing to hear it. He didn't have the sight to see it. He could only do what a dead man could possibly do, and that was be dead and disobey the commands given to him. And that's what Ephesians 2 is saying we were like. Just listen again. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We disobeyed. We were disobeying God, breaking his law, living in sin. And it wasn't just a habit that humans have. Do you see what he says? We were sons of disobedience. It was our complete identity who we were. It's who the unbeliever is. It's their nature. A nature we inherited from our first father, the first person who sinned, Adam himself, making us sons, children of disobedience. It says that in Romans 5 verse 12, that through one man came sin into the world and we all followed in that sin. We were born with sinful hearts, hearts not turned outward towards God, but hearts that were turned inwards towards ourselves. And any parent of little children knows this to be true. You never have to teach a child to do bad. Amen. You've always got to teach a child to do what is right and good. It is natural. It is our nature to be dead in our sin. We were born dead in our sin. It's the most natural thing to humanity to hate God and to live for yourself. But what 
most of humanity don't realize and what perhaps some of you sat here this morning don't realize is that there are great implications to being dead in sin. And Paul tells us two great implications of our sin. The first implication is very quick. It's that the unbeliever is not as independent as they think. They are not living merely just their way. They're not living merely just according to their law and their plan and their purpose. In verse 2, what does Paul say? He says, we are following the prince of the power of the air. That is another name for Satan. To break God's law, church, to sin... And to live dead in that sin is to do what Satan wants you to do. It's to follow him and his plans. Do you realize that? That there is no neutrality in this world. You either follow God or you follow Satan. You may not be singing his songs and saying, hail the enemy, hail the evil one. But when you sin and live in your sin, you are doing exactly what he wants and following him. That's the first implication of our sin. The second implication, though, is even worse than that. Even worse than that. In verse 3, Paul says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The second implication of being a lawbreaker, dead in sin, is that you are, we were, a child of wrath. We live in a world where people get really angry. And they get angry at unjust things, be it sexism or racism or financial and political lies. People, you and I, rightly so, get angry at injustice. And people get angry at injustice in, in because they're made in God's image. That's why, that's why we get angry at unjust things, because we're made in God's image, because it is God who gets angry at unjust things. It's God who hates injustice, and we have received that from him when we were made in his image. And the most unjust thing is crime. That's what we get most angry at, the breaking of laws, and specifically crime against the innocent. That's what we get most angry at. And God, God has never sinned and he never will. He is holy and he is perfect. He is loving and he is kind. He is innocent of any wrong. And yet, we broke his laws. We committed cosmic crimes against the creator, the innocent and the holy God. And that holy God is angry at injustice. He's angry at sin and sinners. Why? Because he is just, because he is righteous, because he is good, because he is fair. And God's anger, God's wrath is hovering over the lawbreaker. Sitting just above the sinner. If you go to New York on New Year's Eve, you'll see a famous sight. You'll see a huge, a huge ball suspended up in the air. And as people count, down, 10, 9, 8. The, the ball slowly drops on each, on each count. 10, and it drops. 9, and it drops. And then eventually, 3, 2, 1, midnight, and it falls, and it drops, and there's fireworks, and there's cheers, and everyone is excited and happy. Now imagine you're in New York, standing underneath that massive ball, right underneath it. Now imagine that massive ball is a massive hammer. 
Now imagine that that massive hammer is filled with the fiery wrath and anger of God. And that hammer of heavenly wrath is hovering right over you. And every minute of every day that you live, it slowly drops a little lower, a little closer. And every sin you commit, every moment you break God's law and do not love him with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, your whole strength, it drops a little closer and a little lower. Until the moment when your life ends or Jesus returns to earth and the countdown has ended and the hammer falls and comes crashing down upon you. Not with fireworks or cheers, but only resulting in eternal fire in hell and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. If you are an unbeliever this morning, if you do not have a real life-transforming faith in Jesus Christ this morning, in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, then you are currently standing underneath that wrath filled, fiery hammer of God. Do you know when it will drop? And if you, like me, are a Christian, then you need to remember that this is who we once were. This is where we once stood as a child of wrath. Now imagine if I finished my sermon there. We would struggle to sing our next song. But praise God, my sermon does not end there. And my sermon does not end there because Ephesians does not end there. And Ephesians does not end there because God does not end there. God is not finished with you yet. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, Paul continues with these famous and most wonderful words. He says, you who were once dead in your sins and your law breaking, but God, but God being rich in mercy. Hallelujah. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him. He raised us up with him and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable, unending riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, church, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing because you are dead in your sin. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk, live in them. Yes, Christian, a person of God was once dead, but they are now alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now you, as a Christian, have ears to hear this. You have eyes to see this and that heart to love him because you have been made alive. But who did this great work? Who did this great thing? So was it you? No, it was God who did it. God made you alive. The one you rebelled against has made you alive. Yes, you were the one who made yourself continue to stay dead in your sin, but you could never have made yourself alive. You were dead. Only God could make you alive. Just, just think about it. Just think about it. When I was at that funeral earlier in the year, there were many people in that room who wanted this 
person to be alive. But there was no amount of shaking him, of shouting at him, which could have brought him to life. They couldn't do it. And for sure, that person who was dead couldn't bring themselves to life. If they could, they would, but they couldn't. They were dead. And that was where we were. That was our position. However great the preacher was, however much we went to church, however much charity work we participated in, however well we parented, nothing we did could atone for our sin. Nothing could take us out of the way of the hammer of God's wrath and make us alive. Only God could do that great work. Just listen to these words again. But God, in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, while we were still dead, in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God did this great thing, and he did it by his grace. What does that word mean? Grace means the unmerited, unearned favor of God. Unmerited, unearned favor of God. And when you were a criminal, when you were a lawbreaker dead in your sin, God loved you even then. And in his unearned favor, he looked upon you and he took you and woke you up making you alive forever. You were dead. You couldn't say yes to Jesus. You couldn't pray a sinner's prayer. You couldn't walk down the aisle. You couldn't read enough of the Bible or come to church at all with eyes to hear, eyes to see and ears to hear. You couldn't make yourself a Christian. Only God could make you alive with Christ you were dead. And God, by his grace, made you alive. And then when you were alive, when you could finally hear what the preacher is saying, when you could finally see how good Jesus is, he then gave you the gift of faith. That's not even of yourself either. He put faith in your heart to believe and go to Jesus. That's exactly what verse 8 and 9 says, isn't it? For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of your works, so that you cannot boast about anything, but only praise him. By grace alone, through faith, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you were once dead, but hallelujah, you have been made alive. How? 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 How could God just, just move that hammer of wrath away and give me life? I thought he was just. I thought he was fair. I committed crimes. They deserve punishment. How did he just do it? The answer is Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Son, who came from heaven to earth and became human just like you. But he never broke a law like you did. So he was never dead in his sin. He had no sin. He was always spiritually alive. And, and he put himself under that hammer of wrath meant for your sin and meant for you a sinner. He pushed you out of the way, letting the hammer fall upon him and taking and satisfying the fullness of God's wrath meant for you. The anger, the punishment, the eternal wrath and hellfire that you and I justly deserve, Jesus took. And that's what happened at the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's why we drink wine and eat bread in remembrance of him. Because Jesus, the innocent son of God and son of man, died a criminal's death and was crushed by the fiery wrath of his own father in our place. He died for you who was already dead. But, 
three days later, God resurrected his son from the grave to new and glorious eternal life. And all those Jesus died for, he also rose for. So now your sins are forgiven, the punishment of your sin is taken away, and you are made alive in Christ's life. You're free from death, free from Satan, free from hell, free from wrath, free from sin forever. All because of Jesus, all because God loves you. Christian, we are the people of God. We are not like everyone else because we were once dead, but now alive in Christ alone. That is the gospel. And you may be examining yourself this morning and realizing that, okay, actually, I'm not who I thought I was. I'm not a faith-filled, transformed follower of Jesus. I'm actually a lawbreaker. I'm actually dead in my sin. Well, you too can be made alive this morning. If you repent, which means to turn away from your sins, which means to change your mind about how you have lived. If you repent and move towards Jesus, believing he is the son of God, crucified and killed in your place and resurrected in power. If you believe in him and if you confess in your heart and with your mouth that Jesus is your savior and your Lord, then you will receive the forgiveness of sins. You will receive eternal life in relationship with God, your creator and your father. You will become alive and that can happen this morning for you if you believe in Jesus. Isn't God good? The gospel is good. And it's the gospel which sets us apart as people of God from just mere people. We were once dead, we are now alive. But then secondly, the second primary marker, and remember this one is shorter, the second primary marker that Paul shows us that sets the people of God apart from the people of the world, that sets you apart from everyone else, is that you were once dead, now alive, once separated, now united. Listen to what Paul says in verses 11 to 14. Therefore, because of everything we just heard, therefore, Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by ab abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one, one body through the cross, thereby killing the hos, hostility. There's a lot in there. Let me explain it. Because it's good. It's worth it. Paul is writing this letter, remember, to the church in Ephesus. And that church was filled with a mixture of Jews and non-Jews, otherwise known as Gentiles. And he reminds them that when they were dead in their sin, they were also not just separated from God, but separated from each other, Jew and Gentile. 
Paul says there was a dividing wall between them. And he's not just using imagery there. No, no, no. He's actually referencing a real wall between Gentile and Jew. In the, the, the temple in Jerusalem, during this time, 2,000 years ago, in the Jewish place of worship, you had a room named the Holy of Holies, which is where God's presence was found. And only the great high priest was allowed in that room one time every year. But then it was the Jewish men outside of that room who were allowed nearest to the room by worshipping in the inner courts of the Jerusalem temple. And then after the inner courts, there were some other courts for the women who were Jews. Just a little bit further back from the men, but separated nevertheless. And then even further back in the outer court, way back, was no Jew, male or female, it was only the Gentile worshippers. And the only thing which separated each court, each section, was a dividing wall about waist height. Paul is reminding the church at Ephesus that the women and the Gentiles, they now sit next to you in their church... The Jews and the men, they now enjoy refreshments with after church. They were all once separated from each other, segregated from each other, divided from each other. There was even hostility between them. That was until God, being rich in mercy, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take away those Jewish ways of worship, the ordinances of worship, Paul says, that separated male and female, Jew and Gentile, and Jesus took them away and fulfilled them and and put them away to not be used anymore through the shedding of his own blood. Fulfilling in this sacrifice the laws of worship and creating a new temple, a new house of God's presence. And that temple would now no longer be made by bricks and mortar, but will be his own people, the church. They would now be the household of God, made up of Jew and Gentile, male and female. All who had died, but were now alive, were once separated, but now are united in Jesus Christ. How amazing is it that the cross didn't have only vertical implications of bringing peace between man and God, but also horizontal implications of bringing peace between man and man, woman and man, Gentile and Jew. Christ's cross puts an end to division and separation. Christ's cross puts an end to division and separation. And it wasn't just Ephesus with Jew and Gentile which needs to hear that, because don't we need that in our world? Don't we need to hear that fact as as we watch the news and it, it keeps speaking about how there is division and separation and hostility between Russia and Ukraine and conservatives and labor and men and women and old and young and black and white. Fills our world, fills our news. But it's not just in the world. Isn't that also seen in our churches? It was MLK who said that 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning is the most segregated time in America. Perhaps he was also right for the UK. We have churches for old people. We have churches that are purposed for young people. We have churches for Koreans and Nigerians. We have churches for blacks and we have churches for whites. We have churches that are filled with the wealthy and churches that are filled with the poor. It seems that separation is everywhere. Do we even see it in Ridgeway? Do we even see separation in Ridgeway? Because by God's grace, Ridgeway is an incredible church. Amen. 
By God's grace, we are a multi-ethnic, multi-wealth, multi-generational church. And yet, who do you speak to after church? Who do you care for once Sunday is finished? Is it always your kind of people? Do we look down on certain people in church because they're not like us? Don't think like us. Don't speak like us. Do we speak and think patronizingly of certain people in church? Maybe not to their face, but behind closed doors. Would the world look at us and see the same separations in our church as they see in the world? Or would they see a supernatural peace and love and affection between us as brothers and sisters in Christ? Because that's what we're supposed to see, isn't it? Isn't that what Paul says in verses 17 to 22? And he, Jesus, this is the last part of Ephesians chapter 2, he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who was near. Far off is the Gentile, near is the Jew. Peace to them all. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens of each other, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone of this new house, in whom the whole structure being joined together, joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. Paul is clear. Gentile Jew, black, white, rich, poor. There are no two ways to God. No two ways to heaven. There is one way to one holy God. And that is through the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ the only way to the only God. And we all come to God through the same way, the cross. And it's at the cross that we're all made equal. Great sinners in need of a great savior. Doesn't matter how big your bank balance is. Doesn't matter how much charity work you have done. Great sinners in need of a great savior. Sinners saved by grace. We who believe in Jesus were once dead, now alive, have been made into a new household of God, a new family within which God lives. There's a fascinating moment in Jesus' life when he's with his followers and Jesus' biological family turns up and they ask to see him and they, t and they say that they are his mother and his brother and his sisters. And Jesus says, no, you are not my mother, my brother, and my sisters. And he points to the followers of Christ. And he says, these are my mother, my brother, and my sisters. I've pondered that story this week a lot. And I've had to ask myself, do I prioritize my biological family over my spiritual family, my true family, the church. Now you might say, hang on, pastor, hold up. My biological brothers and sisters, they are my blood, thus they are my priority. Well, I would respond to that, are they? Of course, physically, they are your blood. But the Bible says, spiritually and eternally, I am now your blood. Isn't that what Paul says in verse 13 and 16? That we've been united together, you and me, by the blood of Christ. When you become a Christian, you experience a blood transfusion. So now it's the blood of Christ that spiritually runs through your veins just as it runs through the veins of the Christian sat next to you. No longer is that person just a person in church. No longer is that person even just a friend. 
They are now your brother and your sister and your mother and your father. And that challenges us. That challenges me because Jesus prioritized his spiritual, his true brothers, his true sisters over his biological brothers and sisters. And I wonder, are we? This new family we have is a gift from God. And I do believe we should put more effort into enjoying and building up this new family we have in God. We should invite more people to our house after church for a meal. We should take more time after the Sunday service to learn people's names, ask about their lives, pray with them when they're finding things hard. We should love each other more with more than just a mere hello on a Sunday, but we should care for each other in the week also. And not just the usual people, church, not just our kinds of people, but everyone in our family, all kinds of people. Jesus did say the world will know us by our love for one another. And so, church, we are not like everyone else. We are the people of God, and that means we are people as defined by Scripture, and we are people who are once dead, now alive, once separated, now united, all and only through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That makes me want to pray. So I'm going to pray. And as we pray, the worship team could come back up nice and quietly, please. Almighty, triune, and holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for the good news of the reality of our salvation from sin, our salvation from Satan, our salvation from hell, and our salvation from the wrath of God. We thank you so much, Jesus, that you came. You came and you drank. You drank the fullness of God's wrath for us. You satisfied the fullness of God's wrath for us. I thank you, God, that even when we were dead in our sins, even when we were enemies of the cross, you brought us near and made us alive in King Jesus. I thank you that you didn't just make us alive now to be isolated, to be alone, but you've brought us into a new family, a new family of all kinds of people from all over the world. And I pray that you help us, God, that as you've challenged us and encouraged us, that you help us to love one another as Christ loves us. Help us to not just stay in our cliques and our types, but to recognize that we're all of one blood in Christ Jesus. Oh God, and for any unbeliever in this room, Lord, I pray that you do indeed reveal to them their sin and how dead they are in sin, and reveal to them now the great life and salvation available to them in Christ Jesus. God, as we sing and worship, come and meet with us, I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.